Okay, so uh, going to be a little bit of shift here. Um, I'm going to be talking about evolutionary individuality. Um, now, the notion of an individual, both in and outside of biology, is ambiguous. So, in biology, we might mean different things by an individual. We might mean a genealogical entity, uh, like a species or a, a genus or a family, something like that. We might mean a metabolic individual, um, something that takes in resources from the environment and processes it to uh, maintain its in structure and integrity. Or we might mean an evolutionary individual. And those are the things that are usually, that we think about as targets of selection, uh, the units of selection. So I'm going to focus in on, on those, those kind of individuals, evolutionary individuals. And my target today, my brief talk, is uh, we want a more exclusive, inclusive account of evolutionary individuality. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the case of biofilms. That was the first slide, there was a picture of a biofilm there. Um, and I'm going to argue this way. Us philosophers use the word argue. I'm going to make a case this way. Um, I'm going to use the example of multi-species biofilms. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to make the case that they're good candidates for evolutionary individuals, uh, then turn to saying, well, well, wait a minute. I mean, biofilms fail a bunch of standard views of individuality when it comes to genetic identity, reproduction, and reproductive lineages, and then get a, a sort of conclusion, some implications that we need an account of individuality that is decoupled from, from standard reproductive and uh, genetic requirements. So that's what I'm going to do. There, there's the outline, just so you know where I'm going. So first, I'm going to do a little bit of biofilm biology, just to get us on the same page, uh, motivate the idea that these might be arguably good individuals, uh, talk about some standards they fail, and then move on to some general implications I want to draw. So biofilm biology. So there can be single species communities. They can be multi-species. I'm going to focus on multi-species. They can be a handful of different species. They can be dozens of different species. Allegedly in dental plaque, they can be hundreds. Uh, so I'm going to look at multi-species. Uh, one thing that's interesting about, about biofilms is they have this EPS, extracellular polymeric substance, provides it with structural integrity, helps it capture and digest nutrients, protects bacteria from predators by creating barriers, um, wards off antibiotics by um, binding molecules that degrades them, uh, serves as a, a media for quorum sensing, I'll talk about that in a second, and uh, lateral gene transfer, which uh, will be pretty important here. So quorum sensing, so, so just quick stuff to get us on the same page. Cell-to-cell -cell signaling that regulates uh, cell production within a biofilm. So, for example, in the uh, aruginosa biofilm, um, that's, I guess, the sort of the, the keystone species there, uh, some cells pr produce uh, environmental or extracellular DNA for the EPS. Others, for example, produce operons that, that are good for resistance of microbes. I'll, I'll go back to quorum sensing in a, in a couple of minutes, just setting the stage here. Uh, lateral gene transfer, what you're, you're familiar with, but I'll put that up there, a couple of mechanisms that work within um, biofilms, uh, transformation and conjugation. And uh, I'll actually return to talking about lateral gene transfer a little bit in a few minutes. So, okay, so that's a little bit of biofilm bio biology um, or stage setting. So now, now the case why arguably these are, these are evolutionary individuals, why they, they function like things that might be targets of selection. So what I'll do is I'll introduce some criteria. I'll, I'll also have some names on the slide, people who've, who've mentioned this sort of criteria, just to give a little bit of background. Um, and then I'll talk about how biofilms seem to, to satisfy each of these criteria. So um, integration and boundaries is often someone, is something that's cited by people who want to talk about evolutionary individuals. Um, EPSs in biofilms do that very well, holding the parts together. Um, the second bullet, EPS demarcates a biofilm from its environment, right? There's, there's, it, it's a barrier to, to predators, um, to antibiotics. Um, there's a distinction between gene transfer, lateral gene transfer, and the amount of it within the biofilm as opposed to outside. Um, so so it, it, it creates a boundary, so there's, there's, there's the biofilm and the external environment, um, which, which is why I think actually we shouldn't be thinking of biofilms as ecosystems, right? That they clearly define themselves, actually, from 
an exterior environment. Um, integration is the, is the third bullet. Um, communication, which I'll talk about in, in quorum sensing. Uh, lateral gene transfer, and I guess in square codes, helping coordinated processes. Um, uh, for example, mutually beneficial metabolic processes, where some bacterial process, certain compounds, change them, transform them, so another type of bacteria can then process that, and so on. Now, so that's integration and boundaries. Uh, another criterion that some people use is they, they like to highlight division of labor and coordination as something that makes for an evolutionary individual. So again, going back to the um, aruginosa, um, quorum sensing then, talked about it a little bit, but I just want to point out there's division of labor here, right? Different cells are producing different parts of the biofilm, right? And, and moreover, there's coordination among them. There's, there's autoinducers that are released by bacteria, and other bacteria of the same type can uh, sense the concentrations and either tap down or increase the products they're producing for the biofilm. Now, now arguably, there's even... Um, I mean, I want to be cautious when I talk about cooperation. Philosophers are sort of very cautious about this. Um, you know, some people like cooperation as a mark of individuality. Uh, arguably, there's cooperation going on in these uh, biofilms as well. They produce public goods, uh, the bacteria within them, and public good is something that's not only good for the individual bacterium, but also for the other members or some other members. Uh, it doesn't have to be for every, every part of the, the biofilm. Um, so, for example, compounds that then form the EPS. Um, now, public good production is costly, right? It costs a, a bacterium to make it. And so this encourages uh, cheaters, right? You know, because you want to take advantage of another bacterium making a public good, but you're not producing it, but getting advantages of it being there. Um, yet, um, cheaters are, are, are kept in place in, in biofilms, generally. Um, there's a lot of literature on the different processes that, that do this, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm moving along. Uh, um, there's a lot of talk in the biofilm literature about adaptations, and I'm not going to you know, sort of give you a definition of what an adaptation is or something like that. That's a bit of a vexing issue. But, but there's this issue about the level of adaptation. I mean, are there biofilm level adaptations? So Falls and Roughgarden, they talk about the bearer of an adaptation displaying adaptations at the level of the whole that are not present at the level of the components. And, and we seem to have that in biofilms, these, these multi-species biofilms. Um, EPS has reduced penetration of antibiotic um, molecules. And um, as some people sort of point out, they think that that lateral gene transfer itself is an, is an adaptation to help the spread of other adaptations among the parts of a biofilm. But, but the point being is, is EPS is lateral gene transfer. These are not things you found at the level of the individual bacteria, right? They're, they're only at the level of the biofilm. Okay, one other thing just to try to butter you up for the case that these guys are actually evolutionary individuals. Um, again, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reporting, not, not in the lab reporting of my data. Microbiologists that study biofilms frequently talk about adaptive variation among biofilms. I think that's pretty uncontroversial. And moreover, they talk uh, a lot and believe that, you know, there's high transmission of fidelity of, of biofilm traits. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's... The, the question that, that's not interesting is, 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 do they transmit traits from biofilm to biofilm? The question is how they do it. Um, typically, we think of this being done through reproduction. Um, so what I want to now turn in, turn, go to in this talk is, is, look, the case of biofilm raises questions about reproduct what sort of reproductive processes are necessary for individuality, and even how we should conceive of, did I say individuality? Yeah, that's right. And even how we should conceive of reproduction. All right, so what I've done up to this point is sort of background stuff in biofilm biology, hopefully sort of getting you warmed up to the idea, well, maybe these might be good candidates for the evolutionary individuals. So now I want to turn to a bunch of criteria that people often use uh, as markers for individuality that have to do with genetic similarity or various reproductive processes. And I want to say, well, well no, biofilms, I mean, if you think they're decent candidates for evolutionary individuals, then, then these sort of criteria for, which are sort of standard markers for individuals, 
may be problematic or too restrictive. I should say too restrictive. I'm not saying they're problematic in all organisms. It's just using them as universal markers for individuality is problematic. So, so the first one I'll mention is, is single species genome, uh, which is sort of fading out of style these days, but, but I want to put it out there to get it going. The idea that that individual develops from a, a single species uh, genome or a single species. I mean, a lot of people held this. Um, and, and the idea being is if, if you come from a single species genome, there's a certain amount of genetic homogeneity, and that's going to tap down competition among the parts, and you get an individual. Uh, but, but of course, the case of, of multi-species biofilms is going to go against that, right? They're made of multiple species, and not just, you know, in many cases, not just dozens, but, but, but hundreds, right? A rather sort of stark example. But, but the idea that there are, are multi-species individuals, that's not so controversial among a lot of biologists and philosophers that worry about um, individuality and, and, and unit selection. Um, but, but then there's constraints put on what sort of, what would be a, the appropriate kind of multi-species individual, excuse me, the, the kind of multi-species um, group that would then be an individual. And one constraint is, is, is that they're reproducers, that, that can form reproductive lineages, that um, component species within the multi-species individual, they run in tandem such that you get reproductive lineages. So maybe a simple case of that that we've seen a couple of times, at least uh, over the last couple of days, is, is the, the aphid Bucnera uh, multi-species individual. And some people talk about that in terms of an individual, not here, but, but in other places. Um, and, and so the idea being is, is that an offspring so we're thinking of a multi-species individual, right, an aphid buccnera, that that individual uh, has a single multi-species parent such that you can get a, a lineage, right, of multi-species individuals, either singular lineage or branching, usually branching, obviously. Now, um, I mean, there's this question, okay, so do multi-species biofilms form reproductive lineages? Well, traditionally, we think of, of, of offspring having one or two parents, right? I mean, the example I gave before of a multi-species individual in the aphid um, bacteria case, right? I mean, there it's, it's going to be a single lineage parent. I mean, obviously, there's, there's biparental lineages as well. The trick about biofilms is, is they can have dozens, if not hundreds, of parents, right? That a biofilm offspring can have dozens or hundreds of parents. Um, and, and of course, uh, a biofilm parent is going to have dozens, if not hundreds, of offspring. But that's not so much problematic. So prima facie, it doesn't seem that multi-species biofilms form the sort of lineages of reproducers that we normally think about, but much more complicated bushes of parents and offspring. Um, and, and I just want to point out that, that that doesn't necessarily sort of defeat the idea that these guys are going to be, it's my informal guys talk there, the, these these things are going to be um, evolutionary individuals, right? Because what's important is not so much the, the, the topography of, of trait transmission, right? It's that there is and it has a certain degree of fidelity, right? And if it's going to be a really complicated bush, then, then so be it, right? But that's not a defeater to them being um, evolutionary individuals. Uh, whether they can be re reproductive lineages or not, the only point, I'm, I'm not trying to define what a reproductive lineage here, I'm just trying to say that if you use a sort of simple model of one or two parents, then no, but on the other hand, if you, if you want to open up the notion of what's a reproductive lineage beyond that, then, then fine, they, they can fit in there. Okay, a, a real a standard bearer of reproductive criteria for uh, evolutionary individuals are, are reproductive bottlenecks, um, you know, a criterion that we're all brought up on. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of motivations for why this is a marker of individuality. I mean, one is that, that by having the bottleneck of one or a few cells, um, um, all the resultant cells that develop in the individual, right, are going to be from that source. So there's going to be a, a degree of hom genetic homogeneity that's going to tap down competition. Um, another reason is, is some people like uh, reproduct reproductive model next, they think it's, it's useful and important for fostering Evolution, evolutionary novel, novelties um, that uh, mutations in the germline are then passed down to the various parts of an individual um, to its somic cells. Now, 
Of course, you probably know, um, Right, biofilms lack reproductive bottlenecks. I mean, the way they form, I haven't mentioned that yet, is through aggregation. So that's when uh, mo cells from multiple parental um, biofilms uh, come together. Now, now it's, a, a, it's a very sequenced process where there, there are you know, first colonizers that attach and the secondary colonizers, colonizers and tertiary colonizers. But they don't go through a bottleneck. I mean, that's the, that's the important point here. Um, but the interesting thing about biofilms is they arguably have a process that gets the products of bottlenecks, reproductive bottlenecks, um, namely lateral gene transfer, right, that both promotes genetic homogeneity and also does the, the spread of evolutionary novelties among a biofilm's parts. Now, some people have been concerned about, well, you know, how extensive is, is lateral gene transfer? And I have to do some more work with, there's a, a biofilm group at my university. I have to do more work with them to get some more quantitative information on that line. I mean, here I just throw up some quotes of people talking about the high degree of, of lateral gene transfer. And a third quote just talking about it as a mechanism that's selected for to actually do that. Okay, so um, I mean, going through some of these, these reproductive criteria for individuality, I mean, raises sort of this question about the nature of reproduction or production of offspring. So often, you know, we contrast reproduction from aggregation, uh, that these are different things, and, and there are certain standard marks for reproduction. So the first one, reproductive bottleneck, that obviously draws the cleavage between reproduction and aggregation. Uh, I mean, other markers that we tend to see, which I haven't mentioned, things like significant division of reproductive labor, germ soma distinction, which is a version of that. Um, so, I mean, a question is, is, is um, you know, does reproduction have to have these? I mean, these are standard markers. Um, well, biofilms lack these. And, and if, if, if you warm up to the idea that, that biofilms might be good candidates for individuals, then perhaps reproduction is not needed for individuality. But, but that's going to turn on, on how you define what reproduction is. I mean, if you think bottlenecks, reproductive division of labor is going to be important for reproduction, then okay, then, then aggregation has to fall out. If you're going to open up reproduction, then you don't have to worry about that. And, and what I want to point to now is, is that, I mean, there are conceptions of reproduction which don't require those three markers, things like bottlenecks, significant division of labor, and germ somic distinction. So I'll, I'll give you a representative example. example. I'm, not, I'm not trying to promote this as the model of, of reproduction, but just as it were to open it up a bit about different modes of reproduction that may be out there in the biological world. Um, so Jim Grismer, a, a philosopher up at uh, UC Davis, so he's got an idea of, of reproduction that, that he uh, describes this way. It's, it's multiplication with material overlap of mechanisms conferring the capacity to develop. So, so if you turn to, to biofilms, um, well, they have material overlap. I mean, the way that you get new biofilms is colonizers sent out of old bio, biofilms, right? So parts, material parts, are actually starting the new biofilms. Does that material provide uh, biofilms capacity to develop? Um, this is perhaps a little more, more controversial. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk in the biofilm literature about biofilms developing. I, I've been talking to Maureen um, that some of the people who sort of promote that idea have taken it back. But, but I think it's, it's relatively uncontroversial that, that they, have, they, they have a sort of codified life cycle of life stages. Um, plantonic lifestyle, attachment, colonization, growth, dispersal. They're pretty regularized and, and, and I mean, occurring all the time. Um, you know, whether it's, it's a kind of development you're going to find in your karyotes or not, I, I, mean, I don't want to make that argument. I'm not trying to make that argument. But they're definitely going through some sort of life cycle, which is what uh, the Grismere model is going after. Okay, so going back to that question, is aggregation a form of reproduction? Well, I mean, I'm not going to answer that, but, but I think the, the case of biofilms tells us, look, either some individuals don't reproduce or we need to expand the notion of reproduction to include 
include at least some cases of aggregation. Okay, so now, so now I want to back out from, from some of these details and um, give you what I think are some implications coming out of, of what I've been talking about, namely the case of biofilms as testing our notions of, of evolutionary individuality. Um, I mean, first off, the thing to sort of notice is, is, I mean, a lot of our sort of standard criteria of individuality, a lot of the standard reproductive criteria, I mean, they were developed with single species eukaryotes in mind, right? And, and with lots of works in protists and bacteria and stuff like that, we're learning, well, no, there's other ways of trait transmission. There's other ways that offspring are produced. Um, so we need, we need a more pluralistic account that allows for the different modes of reproduction and trait transmission. Another uh, thing I want to draw out of or bring out here um, from what I've said is that we need an account of individuality that is, that is open-ended such that it captures the contingent nature of reproduction and trait transmission. So what do I mean here by the contingent nature of reproduction and trans trait transmission and why? Why promote that, bring that out? Um, well, here's the idea. Um, modes of reproduction and, and, and trait transmission are, are themselves products of evolution, right? They're gene-based. They change. Um, it's a well-known fact of evolution that evolution produces various mechanisms to achieve the same function, right? Biology, evolution is doing that over and over and over again. So, so the what I'm drawing out here is that evolution is capable of producing a variety of ways individuals transmit their traits and reproduce. And, and indeed, I think some of what I've said so far is captured by A here, right, that evolution has produced a variety of, of, of transmission and reproductive mechanisms, right? It's evidence for the sort of pluralistic thing. But, but I, I mean, I sort of want to expand that a bit, right? I mean, B is sort of going to the point that, you know, it would be sort of odd for us to think that we've, we've sort of figured out the tra transmission and the reproductive mechanisms, like we discovered them all and have it nailed, right? That would be a bit presumptuous as we learned. Uh, but then there's this, this, this third point, C, that, that look, it's not as though it's a static thing, right? New, new mechanisms of reproduction and trait transmission can evolve as well. So, so that's why this case that's being made here is that we need an account of individuality that's sufficiently inclusive, right? So that's to get the sort of per, the, the microbial multi-species uh, example that I've been talking about, right, to get a sufficiently inclusive account, but also a con, an open-ended account, right, one that's not saying, well, that can't be new mechanisms. Uh, now, uh, see, time, well, I'm doing okay. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of different counts of individuality out there, and, and I'll highlight one that sort of is not wedded to, well, it can be sort of tinkered with so it's not wedded to certain modes of transmission of traits and accounts of reproduction. And, and this is going back to, to David Hull. David Hull has an interactor notion of, of individuality, and, and lots of people have taken it up and tinkered with it, from Gould and Lewington, excuse me, Gould and Lloyd, to Wilson and Sober, uh, Debray, Dupre and O'Malley, uh, Ford, and somebody who I'm sorry, I don't remember. You tinker with it a bit. Um, I've done some work with this with a grad student of mine. An interactor is an entity that directly interacts as a cohesive whole with the environment. It's environment such that there's differential uh, replication of genes or whatever. Um, now, Hull wrote this and was working on this in 1980, so the heydays of Dawkins' replicator theory. But, but the people who have tinkered with, with the interactor theory notion of individuality um, have, have divorced it from replicator theory, which uh, has certain problems. And, and, and what's important for the interactor account is not the mode of transmission, but that there is transmission fidelity, right? So, you know, that could be in some organisms via replication. It could be uh, via traditional re reproductive markers that I've mentioned before. It could be via the sort of Grismerian uh, account of, of, of reproduction, or, I mean, I have a dot, dot, dot to leave it open-ended. Okay, so just a summary slide for you. So, just because I like repeating myself. <laughs> um, so, so I tried it down as, it, it sort of motivate the idea that biofilms um, shows that we need a more inclusive and open-ended account of individuality that captures the contingent and pluralistic nature of individuality. Um, thank some people.
So a lot of people helped me with this, and people, some of those people are in the room here. This is Mac Miller Pedestro, a former PhD student of mine, who's gone on to greener pastures, who uh, helped a lot of this work. And then there's the people who fund this up in Canada. So that's it. Thank you.